Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, grab your service sheets or your Bibles and uh, you are going to turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, 38 to 45. Matthew 12, 38 to 45. I'm going to read off the service sheets and uh, that's from the Christian Standard Bible. Then I'm going to pray and we're going to spend a little bit of time together uh, looking at this passage. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at Jonah's proclamation. And look, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And look, something greater than Solomon is here. When an unclean spirit comes out of a man, It roams through waterless places looking for rest but doesn't find any. Then it says, I'll go back to my house that I came from. And when it arrives, it finds the house vacant, swept and put in order. Then off it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself and they enter and settle down there. As a result, that man's last condition is worse than the first. That's how it will also be with this evil generation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me lead us in prayer, and then we're going to spend some time looking at that passage. Our Father, thank you that you gather us as your people. You've taken us from being your enemies to being part of your mob. You've taken us from being hostile to be part of your family. You've taken us from the outside and you've brought us inside, and you've done this through your Son, Jesus Christ alone. Thank you that in his life, death, and resurrection, we have everything we need for life now and life eternally. Father, as we listen to these few verses now, let's hear not just the sharp edge, but the foundation of grace behind it, and please apply it to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. What a reasonable request. So respectfully asked. I mean, we always want some evidence, some credentials, when someone makes a substantial claim like, for example, I've brought in the kingdom of God. It's a reasonable request, isn't it, to ask for some evidence? Some substance to those claims, isn't it? It's a reasonable request to ask Jesus to adjust to our demands, our desires, our perceptions. What a load of rubbish. What a load of rubbish. Just pause for a moment and consider what has just been requested in the context. First, the scribes and the Pharisees, a loose alliance of religious leaders from God's people, are literally answering Jesus. Their request is made in the face of everything we heard last week, and I hope you remember what Andrew helped us understand. His stinging rebuke, his quite clear statement that if you're not with him, you're against him. In essence, they've heard his rebuke, they've heard his warning that they're in danger of the fires of hell, They've heard his rebuke to them and their behaviour and then they've poked their tongues out and said, prove it. Prove who you really are. We'll take nothing less than a blazing statement across the skies. Secondly, the request is made not just against the backdrop of that rebuke which we heard last week, but also the immediate actions of Jesus. Look there at verse 22. A demon-possessed, blind, dumb man is healed. Go back a little further to verse 13 and 14 where on the day of rest, a man with a withered hand is given complete restoration in full view of them all. 
Their request flies in the face of what they have just seen and heard, what they've just experienced. Now, I know signs and miracles are different in the Bible. A sign literally is one from the hand of God. A miracle is something that happens in everyday life. But this is a ridiculous request, isn't it? Considering what they've just seen in the last 48 hours. And really, it's not a request at all, is it? It's really a demand. It's a demand for accommodation. Jesus, show us something that satisfies me, that accommodates to my life, my desires, my plans. It's really a thoroughly modern demand, isn't it? Jesus, fit around me and my life. It's not so much a respectful request as a demeaning demand. Jesus, dance for me. Be a performing animal for me. Fit around me and do what I want. Does that sound familiar? Does it feel familiar? Well, the answer of the religious leaders as they consider what Jesus has said is really just more of the same slander, isn't it? Remember last week, words matter. Words reveal the state of our hearts. They're part of the fruit that wells up out from inside us as we respond to Jesus and his claims. Words are the fruit of the tree that is us and the religious leaders of the day. Words are an emblem of the response we have to Jesus. And these men respond to what Jesus has said and say, dance for us, Jesus. Accommodate us, Jesus. Do what we want, Jesus. And at that point, as Jesus replies, we need to picture the scene in our minds. As far as we can work out from verse 15, Jesus has had a strategic withdrawal. Matthew uses this moment to remind us of who Jesus is, the servant, the servant of God who's come to deal with this broken world, to make us whole again, to restore us by dealing with our sins, by serving his very own enemies. That's his mission, to restore humanity to the rest we were designed for, a rest available for any person, any person who bears the image of God. And as Jesus has withdrawn, the crowds found him. The religious leaders have used their influential words to disparage him, saying, listen, listen, ladies and gentlemen, he's really working for the devil. They tread on dangerous ground, don't they? We saw that last week. And they continue to work and walk in that dirt of rebellion as they demand a sign. And there are two other groups watching, aren't there? There's not just the religious leaders, they're front and foremost, but there are two other groups watching and listening, and I think Jesus is talking to them too. There's the apostles, the 12, and the crowd. The 12 are the hand-picked eyewitnesses of Jesus' proclamation and practice. They've got a big job in the future to continue his work. The crowd, it's that mass of watching humanity. They're astounded constantly. They're often indecisive, and they really don't know what to do, but, gee, they're enjoying the show. And what Jesus says here is a direct response to the religious leaders, but it has something to say to the apostles and something to say to the crowd as well. Look there at verse 39. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at Jonah's proclamation. And look, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And look, something greater than Solomon is here. Well, that's a decent reply, isn't it? I'm at point two on the outline. Not so much a reply as a rebuke a rebuke that's got its roots in history. You see, if we listen carefully to what Haley read from Deuteronomy chapter 9, 1 to 6, what's God's description of his own people? 
you're a stiff-necked, rebellious, adulterous bunch. That's God's description of his people in the Old Testament. And so when Jesus dredges that up again, do you think the religious leaders missed it? (laughs) You're just like your forefathers who constantly betrayed God. Wandering spouses who did not trust that God would be faithful to his promises. It would have been a little quiet in the room, wouldn't it? Especially when he then unpacks it and says, that's the height of evil. To constantly presume upon the faithful commitment of God. To abuse it by taking it with this hand and rebelling against it with this one. And as Jesus speaks, they're meant to realise that they're doing it again. And such unfaithfulness warrants no more signs. They've already got it. They've already got the sign. Did you see it there? They've already received the sign of Jonah. Look at verse 40. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart, in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Whenever someone says Jonah to a bunch of God's people, what do you immediately think? That's why we stopped the reading at verse 14 and didn't go through to verse 17 because you know where Jonah's going to end up, don't you? He's that bloke that hung out in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now, there's all sorts of debate about what this means. It's worth pausing and thinking about what Jesus is saying here because Jonah performed no miracles, did he? Jonah performed no signs, did he? Jonah just existed. He was the sign. His being, his mere existence and the things that he said were the sign. And that had an effect on those around him. And he's identified by the one event that occurred to him. When you say belly, fish, three days, three nights, you all immediately think Jonah. And then you remember his existence. So Jesus is drawing that connection between Jonah and he. Just as the man Jonah was the sign and remembered by that key event, so too Jesus is the sign remembered by the key event that happened to him, dead and buried. Let me say that again. Just as Jonah is the sign and remembered by the key event that happened to him, so Jesus is the sign remembered by the key event that happened to him. So as they stand there demanding another sign, the sign is standing right in front of them, isn't he? You're going to get no more than Jesus. You're going to get no other sign than Jesus, his existence, his being, his proclamation, and that is enough. That is enough. And if you ignore it, let me tell you, there's a very serious warning in verses 41 to 42. The men of Nineveh will will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at Jonah's proclamation. And look, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And look, something greater than Solomon is here. It's a a pretty hard one-two punch, isn't it? Because they know their history. And the, the the two verses mirror each other in structure, in intent, in seriousness. And in case we missed it, the two groups Jesus talks about are not Jews. They're outsiders. They're not even connected to Abraham's family. On the last day, when every human being is gathered before the throne of God to give an account for their lives before God, the day when our words will be recalled, the day when our words will be recalled, Jesus gives us a very stark picture on that day. He's saying to the religious leaders, on that day, the citizens of Nineveh will be there, the queen of Sheba will be there side by side, and they will condemn you. 
What a shock. But it's clear, isn't it? You want a sign. He's standing in front of you. They received a lesser sign and they came back to God. You reject the greatest sign. What will happen to you on judgment day? Jesus is here. He's greater than Jonah. He's greater than Solomon. In fact, he is the essence, the person to whom the whole Old Testament was pointing. And you dilly-dally, you prevaricate, you oppose, you slander and dodge, you demand and you want his accommodation. On that great and final day, you will be condemned, you religious leaders by a bunch of Gentiles who heeded a lesser warning and came back to God. Pretty blunt, isn't it? I think it's generous, but it's still relevant, isn't it? Remember who's listening? There are three groups, aren't there? Religious leaders, apostles, and the crowd. For those who demand a sign, there are no more. There are no more signs. Jesus is it. There's nothing more needed to reveal the nature of God, the commitment of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the truth of God, the heart of God, the salvation of God, the justice of God, the judgment of God, the desire of God, the warmth of God. Nothing more than Jesus. Nothing more persuasive to the human mind and heart than Jesus. Nothing more that needs to be offered to people than Jesus. And notice that it's Jesus as he is. It's not the Anglican Jesus, not the Presbyterian Jesus, not the Baptist Jesus. It's Jesus as he is there in the pages of history, in the pages of God's word. That is all you need. No more science. For those who demand that Jesus accommodate to them, adjust for them, work around them, there's no adjustment with God in that sense, is there? No accommodation in this matter. Jesus is both Saviour and Lord, the son of Abraham and the son of David, as the first verse of the book tells us. We take him as he is. Saviour and Lord. He will not perform for us. He will not adjust his mission for us. He will save us and then rule us, just as his Father commanded him to. And for those who are watching, those who are prevaricating, those who are enjoying the spectacle and the performance, there is a day when a decision about Jesus must be made and answered for. And all you need is Jesus to make that decision. Well, Jesus closes, and I'm at point three on the outline, uh, with a very interesting little warning, doesn't he? Verses 43 to 45. And let me tell you, I've never heard a kid's talk on those verses. Now, in many ways, it seems to be a strange warning. Let me just read it to you. When an unclean spirit comes out of a man, it roams through waterless places looking for rest, but doesn't find any. Then it says, I'll go back to my house that I came from. And when it arrives, it finds the house vacant, swept, put in order. Then off it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and settle down there. As a result, the man's condition is worse than the first. That's how it will also be with this evil generation. Now, notice how Jesus finishes there. Evil generation, that's how he started. So he's talking about the same bunch of people in front of him and the same issue, isn't he? Closes it out with a neat bookend. I think to understand this, we need to go back to two verses that Andrew touched on last week, verses 28 to 29. If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. 
How can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can rob his house? The stronger man is here, isn't he? We learned that last week. The stronger man is here. That's Jesus. And he's come in to proclaim and practice, establish the kingdom of God. And on this mission, he's removed the strong man from the houses. And as he does that, that strong man wanders. That's the evil spirit. Jesus has come to roll back sin and bring the blessing of God. He's come to evict the bad tenant, the one who thought that he could set up an alternative kingdom represented in this story by the strong man or the unclean spirit. Jesus has come to clean the house. But every house needs a tenant, doesn't it? And so now Jesus has cleaned the house, you've got to work out which tenant you're going to have. Now remember, it's only an illustration. But once Jesus has cleaned the house, who will be the tenant is what he's saying to the religious leaders. You've got your sign, you've got your kingdom, who's going to be the tenant in the house? You see, Jesus is warning to those who want more than him, to those who want him to perform, to those who want him to adjust and accommodate to them. Jesus is warning You've got to choose the tenant. To reject Jesus as the new tenant of the house, to reject the stronger man, is to invite the strong man back with his friends. It's a warning that drives home verse 30. Anyone who is not with me is against me, and anyone who does not gather with me scatters. The kingdom's here. Jesus is the stronger man. The king is here. He's come to cast back sin. But you've now got to work out where you stand. And there are only two tenants in this world, Jesus or not Jesus. There's no middle ground. And to demand a sign from Jesus, to demand his performance or his accommodation, is to invite the old tenants back and it will be worse. Well, he's drawn the lines very clearly, hasn't he, this Jesus? Very clearly for those listening, those watching, those reading, the religious leaders, the apostles, the crowd. Jesus, give us a sign. We demand a sign. Dance for us. Accommodate for us. I am the sign. You must deal with me. In fact, Jesus is all that anyone needs to deal with God, to deal with his commitment to reverse sin, to restore people to true humanity. As a very clear statement to all the groups listening, Jesus is all that you need to demand anything more, to demand anything less, to demand his accommodation, to demand his performance. That's not how you deal with Jesus. It's a clear statement to us. We've got to deal with Jesus as he is. And if he is the tenant in our house to carry the image further, we must only offer Jesus as he is. There's a very clear warning here about a number of areas, isn't there? A very clear warning about prevarication, about indecision, about being lukewarm, about procrastination. Jesus doesn't dance to our tunes. Jesus doesn't perform for us. Jesus doesn't accommodate to my demands. Jesus comes to be my saviour and my Lord and I need to deal with him. And that remains the same. As it did for the religious leaders, it does for us. There he is. Take him or leave him. But if you take him, he'll take all of you. 
He'll take your wholeness. He'll be the best tenant you've ever had. He will restore you to true humanity. He's either the tenant of your life, your Lord and Saviour, or he isn't. The religious leaders and the crowd wanted him to dance, to take the benefits of him without the residency of him, to enjoy the kingdom without the commitment to the kingdom. And Jesus doesn't play those games. Here is Jesus, the servant, the saviour, the Lord. Take him or leave him. Let me pray. Father, we are so thankful for Jesus. As the first verse of this biography of Matthew reminds us, he is the saviour who rolls back sin, the son of Abraham who shows your commitment to our brokenness. And he's the son of David who rules in all goodness and justice and mercy. And we are so thankful for Jesus as our saviour and Lord. Father, thank you that you've introduced him to us. Thank you that he desires residency. And thank you that when he is the resident Lord and Saviour, everything is restored in preparation for that final day. Father, help us to deal with Jesus as he is and to offer him as he is so that others are restored and brought to wholeness. Amen.